What's up, everyone? My name is Jennifer Milski. This is my YouTube channel. This is my new desk. And this is going to be the last interview that I did at the 21 convention. Actually, I did interview uh, Socrates and Bulldog, but the audio is really bad and the, and the camera work was super glitchy. So I might use little segments. But at any rate, this is the, this is the last interview that I did. Uh, at the convention, and if you like Will, which I think you will, um, he has a podcast called The Renaissance of Men, and my husband and I were recently interviewed on it, so if you would like to listen to that, that'd be great, and even if you don't want to listen to it, you should go check out his podcast, because he's super dope, <laughs> okay? All right, next week, I'll be going back to normal, I'll look you in the face and give you an opinion about life videos, you know, the normal format, okay? Um, bye. Bye. Who did you meet here over the past four days that you had to talk with, like content creators? Who oh, content. You... Yeah. Oh, man, I'm trying to think. Um, when I spent time with you, there's actually a, a person who didn't speak. His name is Will, and he was um, marvelous, and he's starting a podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Felsky. This is my YouTube channel here still again at the Men's 21 convention and the 22 convention. This is my new friend, Will. Will has not... <laughs> Will has not, you haven't seen any of the 22 speakers, have you? No, I haven't. Okay, but you've been to the Patriarch or just the 21? I've been bouncing back and forth between the two. How do you feel about what you've heard thus far? Oh, it's incredible. Tell me why. That's incredible. Well, all the speakers here have such unique takes on what it means to be a man and on masculinity, and they're all very um, authentic and um, integrated in their approach, and they each approach it in a different way. And so talking, uh, listening to Tanner Guzzi will be different than listening to Ivan Throne, will be different than listening to Elliot Hulse. And they're all saying such powerful and yet complimentary things. And yes. it's in incredibly inspiring for me to help me pull from all of them and learn. What, what I've said to some other people is it seems to me that some people take the red pill as a brand. Like, yep. like here's information, now go and do this exact thing because that is what you do with this information. Right. But it seems that the more correct attitude would be the red pill. Here is information now go and live a unique life with that information the way you see fit and i think that's represented here with the speakers would do you think i'm smart for saying that i think you're <laughs> i think you're absolutely dead on for saying that and also very smart oh uh, thanks thanks yeah uh so what i know that this is on the spot but is there a condensed red pill that you've taken from this like all the information is there is there um, a consolidated message that you could convey that you learned about the red pill, the specific topic yeah, of the red just, pill, or one message like I take all, away from all of this. Yeah, one message you take away from all of it. Yeah, yeah. Men are men are growing and changing and transforming, and we're going to transform the world with us. This state that we've been in for the past hundred years, hundred and forty years or so, in which men have been disempowered and women have been, I would say, falsely empowered. But kind of. Yeah. Exactly. It would, it would appear that women have been empowered, but in fact they've been empowered to be only more masculine and more like men and less like women. That's a false empowerment. It's framing empowerment in financial terms only. A woman is powerful if she can earn money, if she can compete in the marketplace. That is not inherently feminine, that's actually inherently masculine. So it's forcing women to be more masculine, more competitive. And that's how we're framing empowerment. And that's a false empowerment. It's not becoming more themselves, it's yeah. becoming more this other image and taking men out of that image. And I, I don't know that that works for either men or women. So I've been thinking, you, you're philosophical, so I have kind of a dreary question for you. Sure. It occurred to me, what, do you think that there's a possibility that they could socially engineer men to be attracted to more masculine women? So, you know, in the 60s, women were very attractive, who were very thin. And now in the past 15 years, it's the big butts curvy. And I, I just wonder how much manipulation and power they have where, I mean, do you think it's possible that they could get, no? No, okay. no. I mean, it's, it's um, there's a saying in this community, desire can't be negotiated. Desire is something you either feel or you don't. And you can try and convince yourself that you feel desire for somebody but really, the body wants what it wants or doesn't want what it doesn't want. The body can't be negotiated with. And so um, 
if you're talking about what makes healthy relationships, you're talking about sexual attraction and sexual fulfillment at, at, at bottom. There are more layers on top of that that are equally, you can't just have a passionate sexual relationship with yes. your partner and have it be a good relationship, and I think we all know that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a passionate sexual relationship at the core of your relationship, it's just not going to work either. And so when you're trying to uh, condition men to say, this is attractive and this is sexy, and their bodies are like, yeah, okay, right? Right. In, in the same way, in the same way, it's the same for women. It's like, yes. hey, you should be really attractive to, to the dad. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Or the dad bod. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah, I guess you're saying it, People Magazine. So yeah, I'm mean, bought in. It just doesn't work over the long term. Maybe you can engineer it for a few years mm -hmm. or for a short term trend, but in terms of building a society on for decades at a time and creating a prosperous growth for children over generations, it's just not going to work. Here's a theory. Yeah. So women, feminists, uh, well, I saw some pictures, some before and after pictures of very feminine women that went to the feminist side and then became very scary to me. Like, shaved heads, really pointy eyebrows, really dark makeup. Pierced One, nose. Yeah, just the whole mutilation of, of the feminine. Yeah, tattoos. The theory seems to be that they're becoming more masculine. But do you think, May, and I'm only asking these questions because you're more philosophical. It's fine. Do you think that some women are doing that because they're so afraid of a real man and they haven't seen it? So they know the way to repel a real man is to look so atrocious? It's possible. Yeah. No. I don't I don't know for sure. I know that for me a good example is tattoos, right? Yeah. So a tattoo they're just kind of in our culture now is this thing that everyone kind of does. A tattoo is fundamentally what's called a scarification ritual. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. You're, scar you're literally scarring your skin and injecting ink into it. Okay. Uh -huh. So for when a man gets a tattoo, he's going through a scarification ritual to, to prove his toughness. Because that's a man's value. Watch uh, Where's Your Masculinity to, to learn more about... Because you're, you're kind of talking about initiation into In a way. mind frame. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But when a woman gets a tattoo... Like, particularly the big ones up on the neck that are really popular now, it's a woman doesn't need to prove her, who's she proving her toughness to. Like, I'm going to get this tattoo and I'm going to show how tough I am. Like, who is that supposed to appeal to? Generally, it's a sign, I tend to view it as a sign of trauma. It's like if I see a woman covered in tattoos, it's like, wow, something really terrible perhaps has happened in the past. And I'm very, very sorry that you feel the need to scar yourself to prove your toughness to overcome it and to try be, to be more masculine in that way. And many women seriously disfigure the, themselves with tattoos up their neck and their faces. And it's like, I feel so terrible mm -hmm. because a woman shouldn't have to display her toughness in that way. A, a, you know, men and women both need to be protected in different ways. But I don't believe that a woman's value is, is in her toughness. Do you think it's possible that some women get tattoos not for that reason, that that because you're a man, you're, you're looking at it in the way you see it as, as, a, as a more masculine thing. I'm just trying to play double. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Where maybe a woman would... Here, I'll be, I'll be a woman. Please. And, yeah. I, and I have a tattoo. You do a great job. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't have any tattoos, but I might say, well, I'm just trying to showcase and symbolize parts of my life that are important to me on my body to commemorate them. Sure. Would that be possible? I mean, I hate to, of course it's possible. Oh, of course it is. But you're still scarring your body. You're still choosing to sit down and scar your body permanently. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever artistic value or symbolic value you assign to the tattoo, the act is still a scarification ritual. Mm -hmm. It's still a disfigurement. And that act, that act has different meanings for men and for women because men and women are different complementary beings. Mm -hmm. So a man scars himself to prove his, his toughness. And, you know, to be fair, there are, like, I lived in New Zealand for a while, and the Maori culture, you know, women, women in the Maori culture do get tattoos. You know, men will get called a moko, and a man will get a full facial moko. That, you is know, it the tattoo, or is it the, the scars that raise up? It's, it's it, both, but okay. yeah, yeah it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole facial thing. And, then, and women in, in that culture do get tattoos on their face, much smaller ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that, like, you know, some, some women will get small tattoos to... You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the big full so, sleeves. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And up the neck and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Just to be real clear that, yeah. like, you know, you get a little tattoo on wherever, and it's like, it's not a big deal, but you get all sleeved up and stuff and looking all tough. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different thing. So to, to commit to that level of ritual 
that level of scarification, which has different symbolic value, psychological value for a man and for a woman. Okay. Let's say that there's a man listening to this, and he's starting to become more aware, and he wants to be right with himself and the world and take on a natural role as a man. And he's mm -hmm. with a woman who he loves, who's very tatted up. Sure. I know that there's two ways, there's a million ways this could go, but would you say to end the relationship with that woman or to delve into the reasons, if she's available to it, mm -hmm. as to why she has done this and maybe to try to raise together or what do you think of the tattoos like on her arms yeah just like sleep you know mm, like yeah, she, yeah. you know because usually it's like two tattooed people are like, oh, we're tough with the world mm -hmm, together mm -hmm. but men change you know i mean sure, like yeah. in the journey so what would you say to a man who finds himself all tatted up with a woman who's all tatted up we got to cut off her arms you heard you heard it here first. Obviously. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. We're, we're just kidding. No. Right. <laughs> no. Just kidding. Okay. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, you can't get untattooed. And I have tattoos on my arms, uh -huh. and there are times where I'll look at my tattoos. I'm like, why did I get this? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'll look at them. It's like, oh, that's uh, that's wrong. That's not right. I wish I didn't get that. But it's with me. Yes. And, you know, I just have to work with what I've got. Yeah. And so, you know, mistakes made, well, mistakes or choices made in the past are no reason to break up with somebody. Mm -hmm. But I think for, I think it would involve, like if I were, if I were a man mm -hmm. with a heavily tired up woman, I would say like, well, let's talk about what was going on for you, why you yeah. did this. Yeah. yeah, like what was at the root of this? What what were you seeking to accomplish? How did you feel when you were getting it? Like, do you want to talk about your past? Do you want to talk about your mother or your father or mm -hmm. your family? And find what's at the root of it. And I think if, if both partners can go into that process of trying to explore what's at the root of, of that experience, they can come out both phenomenally transformed and healed by engaging in this healing and transformative process. Like, uh, you know, I, I knew a girl in, um, in Australia and she had all these tattoos that she had gotten in another phase of her life. And I, I remember looking at the tattoos, I'm like, your tattoos are really weird. And she's like, you know what, I went, I got those at a whole other phase and I don't even like them, I forget they're even there. Yeah. So the tattoos themselves through her own healing process had been drained of their charge, I guess yeah. you might say. Yeah. And so, and, and it showed on her face and on and her character. She's like, oh, I don't remember I have them anymore, but she's still got to carry them. Mm -hmm. In the same way, tattoos can get charged with energy. They can symbolize, they can embody negative energy. And through an internal transformation and healing process, you can drain all that negative energy and then it doesn't matter. But if the tattoo is broadcasting, like, look at me, look at how tough I am, which many tattoos do, then there's something inside there that's worth looking into. Maybe not just with the two of them, maybe with a therapist or something like that, but there's something in there to go looking at. I just had a gross thought. Okay. What if, <clears throat> because a lot of women don't really think about promiscuity as being a negative. They don't really think about the sexual partners that, they, that they're and neither, having. And neither do men for and themselves, men. yeah, which sure, is a I'm, thing. Sure, but for women, I wonder if it was in our culture that every man that you have sex with, you had to have their name tattooed on your body. Mm. Like a NASCAR, you know, advertise, uh, advertiser. Okay. How many women would stop engaging in that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's it. That was just a thought. Well, because, you know, at a certain point, it would be like, oh, okay, I, I see. Like, a reminder. Yeah, it's um, like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, who was Bob? <laughs> and yeah. Who Tom? Who were all those guys? Like, yeah. and that's just like, it would be a major turnoff for guys. Yeah. In the same way that it would be a turnoff for girls. Like, who was Stacy and who was Wendy? And like, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Like, yeah. We in, don't. In, in like a seven font. Yeah, no. exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Comic Sans, you know, Papyrus. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, that, that would be pretty bad, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think I have asked you all the questions that I feel good about. Now, Will went out last night, so he's going to go take a nap. Is that true? I, yes, probably. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. I have a cold hand, but warm heart. I also have a cold hand as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very right. much. It was wonderful. Okay. Oh, wait. Will also has a podcast. Tell, I do. Tell them about it. It's called The Renaissance of Men. It just launched last week uh, with Tanner Guzzi, who's a speaker here. He's a speaker on men's uh, style and fashion and personal development. And uh, I will do every week on the podcast one interview. And then I'm also starting a series called Poetry for Men, where I'm demonstrating and seeking to prove that poetry can help men discover and uh, appreciate their inner lives. Because I don't think that there's enough art appreciation and understanding how beauty can really enrich our lives as men. So that will be what I'll be exploring on my podcast, The Renaissance of Men. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not a great interviewer, 
he is. So I would definitely tune into his his station. I totally disagree with her. She's an awesome interviewer. We're both awesome. Yes, we are. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Good time.